Why can't you punish a psychopath? If we could answer this question, we might be able to sleep a little better at night, safe in our knowledge that the people most likely to engage in the worst crimes known to humankind can not only receive the just punishment for their actions, but maybe even be rehabilitated and set on a better path. However, experience with psychopaths has shown time and time again that punishments, even severe punishments like jail time or the threat of the death penalty, are simply not effective at stopping these individuals from returning to crime in the same way that they are for most people. To understand this better, let's take a moment to examine what, exactly, psychopathy is. Psychopathy is a set of traits defined by a callous and unemotional approach towards other people and society as a whole. These traits predict a high chance of recurrent criminal behavior, often of a violent or sadistic kind, with many of the most notorious serial killers in history having shown evidence of psychopathic traits. While psychopathy is thankfully rare, affecting less than 1% of the population, it is more common in legal settings, with around a third of all violent prisoners showing signs of psychopathy. While locking these people up does help to get them off the street, this protection is only temporary, as incarceration and other forms of punishment do not appear to lower their chance of reoffending once they are released. Why is this? Simply put, psychopathic people are built differently. Two major neurobiological differences have consistently been found in research studies comparing people with psychopathic traits to those without. Let's look at each of these differences individually, then see how they combine to set the stage for recurrent antisocial behavior. The first of these differences involves empathy. Psychopathic individuals appear to have the ability to turn empathy on and off at will, rather than being forced to automatically feel the emotions of those around them as most people do. Take a moment to consider this image. If you're like most people, just looking at this picture will provoke an automatic and visceral reaction that is not unlike pain itself. In fact, this sensation is even processed in the same parts of your brain that register physical pain even though you haven't actually been injured. For people with psychopathy, however, seeing this image does not automatically induce this agonizing sensation, and the parts of the brain involved in processing pain stay turned off when watching other people in distress. While it's tempting to conclude that psychopaths are unable to empathize with the feelings of others, this isn't the case, as the regions of the brain associated with empathy do turn on when they are specifically asked to consider how others feel. Instead, it appears that these empathic networks are off by default, even if they can be activated with effort. This explains why people with psychopathic tendencies can be manipulative and even quite charming when they want to be, as they can turn on their empathic switch when it suits them and leave it off the rest of the time. While an off by default empathic switch goes a long way towards explaining the tendency towards violence, it's only half of the equation. The second neurobiological difference seen in psychopathy is a fear response that is reduced or even entirely absent. Individuals with psychopathy do not appear to experience fear in the same way that most people do, with reduced activity of the sympathetic nervous system and its associated fight or flight response being seen. This characteristic boldness not only manifests in a high level of self-confidence and an above average tolerance for danger, but also plays a central role in the ability of psychopaths to resist punishment. Let's see how this plays out using a familiar example. Picture a boy who is trying to sneak a cookie from the cookie jar before dinner. If he's caught, he'll get a swat on the hand, a punishment meant to deter that behavior. Under this sort of threat, a child with normal reward processing will start to experience anxiety while approaching the cookie jar. The level of anxiety gets higher and higher as they approach the jar, and for many children, this anxiety becomes aversive enough in and of itself to make them back down. By walking away from the cookie jar, this anxiety rapidly dissipates, effectively reinforcing the good behavior of not taking a cookie. For these children, even just the threat of punishment is painful enough to make them change their behavior. In contrast, someone with psychopathy and its related fearlessness would not experience anxiety as they approach the cookie jar, so there is no built-in punishment just for thinking about taking a cookie. In fact, people with psychopathy seem to respond even more to rewards than punishments, so if they were to walk away from the cookie jar, they would likely feel more anxiety than going towards it due to the feeling that they've lost out on the opportunity to get the cookie. This makes it so that, for these people, doing the right thing is associated with feelings of anxiety rather than relief. 
In contrast, if they actually go through with it and take a cookie, they are rewarded both by the taste of the cookie as well as the avoidance of the anxiety of lost opportunity. In this way, trait-based fearlessness sets up the decisional calculus in such a way that following the rules is punished while acting selfishly is rewarded. Let's move out of the lab and see how this abnormal response to rewards and punishments applies in the real world. Consider two people who have fallen upon hard times and are desperate enough that they get the idea to hold someone up at gunpoint and steal their wallet. In deciding whether or not to actually follow through on this idea, the first person would consider not only the money they would get, but also the punishment, which would include not only anxiety about going to jail if they get caught, but also the extremely unpleasant experience of seeing someone else in fear and pain, which would occur whether they got away with it or not. Based on these factors, this person would likely decide against the robbery, as the money is not worth both the fear of punishment and the aversive experience of seeing another person's distress. In contrast, if the second person had psychopathic traits, they would not only shrug off the chance of getting caught due to their trait-based fearlessness, but would also avoid the negative experience of seeing the pain of others as they could simply leave their empathic switch off. With these two neurobiological differences in play, there is nothing to hold a psychopath back from the prospect of a financial reward, making them more likely to commit the crime than the average person. This specific combination of both an off-by-default empathic switch and an underlying trait of fearlessness effectively inactivates the usual mechanisms by which society deters crime through punishment and actively hinders efforts at rehabilitating psychopaths to live by the rules of society. This has led to the belief that psychopaths do not respond to rewards and punishments. However, this is not true. While psychopaths don't respond to punishment, they do respond to rewards, and by incentivizing the right kinds of activities, we can set the stage for people with psychopathic patterns to still contribute to society. Indeed, studies have found that some people have the same callous and unemotional traits seen in psychopathy, but do not engage in criminal behavior. These people generally have the same abnormalities in brain regions linked to empathy, fear, and moral decision making, yet they spend their days raising a family and holding a job. If anything, some degree of psychopathy may actually be adaptive in risky fields such as business or finance where fearlessness can provide a competitive advantage, with one study finding that the prevalence of psychopathic traits among CEOs was just over 20%, a rate that is not too far off from the frequency seen in jails and prisons. Through this, we see that biology is not destiny. Even for someone with a disposition towards callous and unemotional traits, an environment that doesn't rely solely on punishment to guide behavior, but instead rewards the right outcomes, can allow these people to go in a different direction and funnel their energy into activities that benefit not only themselves, but society as a whole. Thanks for watching this video. It was my most requested topic on a recent poll I posted on my YouTube page, so subscribe to my channel if you'd like to vote in future polls. I'd love to hear your feedback on this video, so leave a like or comment below. You can also check out my book Memorable Psychiatry to learn more about psychopathy and other fascinating conditions in this field. Until next time, bye for now.